Congrats! This is episode 44 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my co-host, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, Zaki. Um, good to have, good to talk to you again, man. It's been—I feel like it's been a minute. But uh, well, well, we, you and I went to see a movie together yesterday, but we didn't yeah. talk before or after. So I don't know if that counts as going together. That was that was strange. Yes, you, you, you yes. sat directly um, behind me. Did you talk during? <laughs> we we I I don't know like it, it it was almost like we had we made the plan to go see it together and it, there were just so many people that we didn't have a chance to touch base at all and then I was like well I guess we'll just talk when we do our podcast today so mm-hmm. why talk in person what, what, what when we can it? <laughs> <laughs> it's this little movie you might have heard of it's called Star Wars <laughs> it's called Rogue One a Star Wars story <laughs> and here yeah. to talk about Rogue One with us is uh, our guest for this episode, who joined us last year when uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens came out. And I said, you know, we should make this a regular thing, where we talk with Umar Muzaffar about the latest Star Wars movie. It, it should be Muzaffar on Star Wars. That should be our annual thing. Okay, that works. I'm looking for everybody. <laughs> so uh, Umar Muzaffar is, of course, a teacher at Loyola University of Chicago, where he's a Muslim chaplain, teaching courses in theology and literature. He's given thousands of talks on Islam since 9-11. He's also a Hollywood technical consultant for productions on matters related to Islam, Arabs, South Asians, and in 2009, Roger Ebert, the late great Roger Ebert, named him as one of his far-flung correspondents. Thank you, Umar, for coming back. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hey, um, am I the first person on your show to come twice? Uh, uh, no, unfortunately. Oh, Rehan, sorry, Rehan. sorry. So not to come on you, to talk about Islam. You're the you, first you, person <laughs> from Chicago to come on the show twice, so oh, if that means anything, yeah. And and you're the first person <laughs> to talk to us about Star Wars twice. So. Yeah, and <laughs> this not is true. Islam. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope the person before me and the person after me is some big, very serious scholar, just to to put this conversation in proper perspective. <laughs> Well, uh, Pervis, who was it? Was it, it was Rayhan, right? Uh, the first, I think our first back to back was Rayhan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, uh, first two, two, and I think that's it. And so then we've had Shadi. No, then we had Shadi Hamid on uh, twice. That's true. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, uh, Omar, you're in some illustrious company. So yes. <laughs> yes. So okay, so 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 you joined us last year when 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 Star Wars: The Force Awakens came out, and worth pointing out here, you, you're you're a big fan of Star Wars franchise, as is Pervez, as am I, and so that's the great thing about having a venue like this where we get to unpack and let our sort of nerd flag fly. Hmm. You're, you're calling me a nerd. I, I am, but in in the best way possible, because nerd, of course, stands for never ending radical dude. I've never understood that, but that's, that's a beautiful thing. That's, Thank you. Yeah, I think the acronym <laughs> itself is nerdier than the, yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much if you get called a nerd and you respond by saying that, you will get a wedgie. That, that story that's ends right. with you getting a wedgie and possibly oh. ending up in a dumpster somewhere. Oh, wait, wait, wait till the, the, the nerd card I throw it at you now. Uh-oh. You get a wedge Antilles. Oh, Okay. <laughs> You you win. <laughs> I like your touche. I like that one. Yeah. <laughs> so mm-hmm. now now Omar, if I remember correctly, last year you yeah. you you liked the Force Awakens, but you did not love the Force Awakens. I mean, I enjoyed it. Um, I don't think it is possible to have like a uh, an actual objective opinion on that because I mean, it was episode uh, whatever it was, episode seven. Yeah. Uh, you know, months later. Uh, uh, after that conversation, yeah, I found myself thinking I'm not drawn to watch it 500 more times. Sure. Uh, which is how I did feel about Rogue One. Uh, okay. I loved it so much that I want to watch it again right away. Okay. Well, so well, so, so let's let's just uh, let's get right into it. I guess. Well, and- I, I was going to say, Zach, why don't we why don't we maybe all give our kind of non non spoiler takes on the sh- on, on the on the on the uh, on, on Rogue One, and then we can kind of get into the spoiler stuff. Yeah, that's what, what I was, was going to suggest. That yeah. So yeah. so um, 
I mean, I guess, well, Omer, let's start with you, and then we can kind of work our way around. Uh, what you you say you loved Rogue One, so in, in a non-spoiler, like, very yeah. succinct way, uh, somebody comes to you and they say, uh, why should I watch Rogue One without spoiling mm-hmm. anything? What would you tell them? Uh, I'd say if, uh, if you want to uh, uh, appreciate a very Star Wars-like homage to Star Wars, you're not going to like this as much. If you want a really good, complex story, uh, then you're really going to like this. And on top of that, it's a Star Wars story. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Pervez? Yeah, um, I think, I mean, Omar basically captured exactly what I was going to say. I'll, I'll just maybe rephrase it or something yeah. because I, I felt exactly the same way. I felt like I was watch. I watched a movie, I watched a Star Wars movie that had actually grown up with me, if that makes mm, any sense. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, it, I, it was a Star Wars movie for the 42-year-old uh, in me as opposed to the 10-year-old in me. Mm. Mm. Okay, wow. You know, I would agree. It's it's a Star Wars story for the forty two year old in me, as well as the forty five year old in me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh, my my, my non spoiler take is that this is a prequel done right. Yeah, yeah, nice, nice. I was expecting Lion King three and a half. Yeah, yeah sh- but, uh, right. You know that yeah. it, that's that was kind of my concern. Okay, so so actually, but as that's we move, a, that's a really. I mean, obviously not. I mean, it's not completely an apt analogy, but it could have turned into that. You're so oh, right. It could uh, absolutely have been that. Yeah. Lion, Lion King three and a half. I think you just nailed it. Yeah, it could have turned into that. So, um, so from here on in, if you're listening and you have not seen the movie, uh, be aware that we will very possibly be dropping spoilers. So just ha- if you if you plan to see it at some point, hit pause, watch the movie, and then come back and hear us sort of unpack it. Yeah. Because we don't want to tell them that the Millennium Falcon is Optimus Prime's dad. Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry. That's supposed to be like a second from now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Han Solo dies in this one again. Oh. <laughs> and then he comes back and dies again. It's a brutal thing. That's yeah. right. Yeah. I like I like that duel that Yoda had with the Death Star. That was pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> with the Death Star. Yeah. yeah. Judge me by my size, do you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um... You know, this it's this is a what you, what you said earlier. It, it really sums it up for me. That was my concern going in with this with this film was how do you make a story feel consequential when it hasn't been consequential enough to even matter for forty years now, mm-hmm. other than as three lines of text at the front of the original Star Wars movie. Exactly. And and so exactly. that that was the hurdle they needed to clear. And I and I that that. What's extraordinary is not only did they clear it, they actually added an even greater degree of context to the original Star Wars to the point where mm. you watch that movie and you now know just how much was sacrificed yeah. to get you know that disc uh, into R2-D2 at the beginning of the movie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the fact that it was, a, it was a disc, it wasn't like a USB drive. I right. thought that was, uh, I mean, because it was it. a long time ago. <laughs> long time ago being the 90s apparently uh no that yeah i i felt exactly the same way and i mean i guess we're not going in any particular order but um you know i i saw I, okay i don't know about you guys but i i went into the movie with two expectations or not expectations but i should say predictions sure and and, and both of those uh were validated or came true or were validated and 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 so my first prediction was no, none of these guys are getting out of here alive. Meaning, mm-hmm. we're gonna all, we're gonna see all the new characters introduced die, and two, um, uh, that the movie would literally end where Episode Four would begin. Like, mm-hmm. and and, and uh, I guess the second prediction I was expecting a little less of. Uh, like, I was thinking, oh, you know, I don't know, you know, maybe not exactly or whatever, but. Uh, as we as it as it turns out, I mean, it literally ends where I mean, you can walk watch them back to back, Zucky, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, oh yeah, absolutely, uh, and yeah, they fit and, together. Uh, I mean, it's extraordinary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. So where do we where do we start? Where do we start with this one? Uh, I guess I I remember asking this question uh, to uh, to Omer uh, and actually both you guys obviously um, when we talked about Force Awakens. When you say both, uh, be Zuffer and Omer, yes. <laughs> You know, it's funny. I, I wasn't going to say this earlier because we were still in our, it was still in our non-spoiler section or whatever. Yeah. 
But uh, right after we got out of the movie, I was talking to the we we there was like twelve of us that had rolled deep, like watching with our kids and whatnot. And like, like that's why, hence the three rows. I mean, we were in, yeah, we basically we, had, we ate up the middle of the the screen yeah, basically. basically camped out like three sec yeah three rows right dead center kind of thing. Uh, but anyway, um. And I was telling, I was like, yeah, I was like, yeah, you know, because uh, I was telling them, I was telling my cousin who I, had, the other person I'd seen it with, uh, the other couple of people, and how it was. What I, what I, what I appreciated though at the same time about the movie was that it was in equal, not equal parts per se, but but it it it, it did at least recognize and and it and it acknowledged the prequels. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and I mean, maybe not in a in a paying an homage kind of way, but certainly mm-hmm. alluding to them and drawing on them. So, for example, when we first meet uh, Darth Vader, he's on Mustafar. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we assume. Level. We assume. I mean, there's no there's no title card uh-huh. there, but that's the True. assumption. Yeah. True. That, yeah, you're right. They didn't have a title card like they did on many and of the I other planets. I thought that was interesting. I thought that was by design because they wanted to leave it vague, but I. I would. It's a good one. I, I think. I think it adds texture to his character. The idea that that's where he would set up shop, which is where his life just went to crap. Exactly. Mm. See, yeah. exactly. And so, yeah. uh, anyway, the whole point of bringing that up first was because I had the I had like a Freudian or not, I guess what, whatever slip you would call it. I was like, yeah, he, I, we we see the planet Muzaffar, and because I was thinking, yeah, about thanks, man. The, the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw where this is going. <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. This dark, evil land. <laughs> Some guy lives by himself, telling jokes to himself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, where, wait, where was I? So, uh, oh yeah. So the question that I I remember asking both of you guys when we talked about Force Awakens was, I guess, how far into the movie did you realize, you know what, it's going to be all right? Like this is this is this is something special I'm watching here. Uh, I think I realized it. This is going to sound totally weird. Uh, like two hours later, after the film ended. Mm. Oh wow! Uh, okay. And I think I don't know that I was okay with with uh, Force Awakens. I think there was a part of me that was holding my breath the entire time. Mm. Um, and this, it's kind of funny. I wasn't actually planning on watching it right away until Zucky contacted me saying, "Hey, what if we do the podcast?" And I was like, "Oh man, I got to get a ticket." <laughs> and and so I had zero expectations, and that's probably, probably uh, a big reason why I did enjoy it so much. Which is the best way to go into any movie, by the way. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, you know, there's there were the stories about a month or two ago that they had to reshoot some scenes, yeah. and that almost always is not a good sign. Exactly. Uh, but, yeah. Uh, no. Uh, uh, I, I, I got to admit that uh, it also took me a while to completely understand the entire plot. Uh, it was very, very complex. Yeah, uh, it was. As, uh, as in my mind, as I went through it, then I thought, "Oh wow, this was this was fantastic." Exactly. So, I saw yeah. I saw it with the family, and and yeah, I mean, I, I can say definitely, probably in uh, descending order. I mean, I enjoyed it the most. My wife second, and then like the kids were both kind of I don't know, and you know, yeah. they, they enjoyed it, but I don't think they. I, I think they both left saying, "Yeah, we like Force yeah. Awakens more." You, you know, what the I, best part of this is Pervez that like. You keep insisting that you watched it with other people. You watched it with your family. Let's just admit, <laughs> you didn't want to be there alone. So you probably <laughs> <like>. <laughs> <laughs> For that moment of watching Darth Vader and Planet Mozuffer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think... I was probably the same way too, but yeah. I, I think that um, it, it won me over pretty quick. Pretty much right from the prologue. I thought I thought the opening sequence where where um, um, you know Ben Mendelsohn and, and Mads Mikkelsen are, are squaring off with each other. I I yeah. I, I, I talked I talked to my my co-host Brian Hall on my other show, and I I, I said you know what I appreciated about that scene is you have these two great actors. Mm-hmm. Ben Mendelsohn is fantastic. He does not get enough credit, uh, and Mads Mikkelsen is just I mean he's just magnetic, and you just sort of let them. You know, there's no special effects. They're just they're just squaring off. They're acting against mm-hmm. each other in this universe mm-hmm. that we love. Yeah. And yeah. and so it for me it was just sort of sitting back and watching this and you know and and you're seeing the the you know the the moisture evaporators and you're seeing the mm-hmm. imperial uniform and stuff and and you know sort of taken in the fact that we know the 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 aesthetics and and visuals of this universe so well and now we get to see a new story set within that specific milieu that that we ha- has been yeah. untouched since really 1977. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, I, I totally share the sentiment. Uh, as far as uh, Mendelssohn, I 
really discovered him probably about a week and a half ago. Oh, uh, wow. I, I saw a place for uh, Beyond the Pines again. I'd seen it when it came out, and I was bored, and it was online or something, and uh, and so I started watching it, and then I was looking at him thinking, wait, why does this guy look so familiar? Yeah. And then you know I went to IMDb and saw his whole history and yeah. that he's this guy in this new movie, and then I truly appreciated what an amazing actor he is, how versatile he is. I mean, he's yeah. he's been in so many things. It's it's funny actually because a few months ago, I I had a chance to interview Joel Edgerton, mm, who nice. um, yeah, and and uh, and this is actually the second time I've talked to him, and he played Owen Lars in the in the prequel movies. Mm, yeah, and and so uh, one of the questions was, you know, who who is somebody who you've worked with who you you know you've learned from or you admire, and you know he mm. he worked with Mendelssohn, and in, in, they're both from mm. Australia, and he mm. just he could not stop talking about Ben Mendelssohn. Mm-hmm. And yeah, yeah, and I mean, and and I mean, to me, th- this character, C- C- director Krennic, is so fascinating. I just find him yeah. such an interesting guy because mm-hmm. you feel bad for him somehow, despite the fact that he's a vile, horrible person. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about this film, you know, is I mean, the basic test for like a big spectacle film is that if you remove the spectacle, do you still have a good film? Right. right. Yeah. So if you remove this from the Star Wars universe, is this still a good film? Yeah, it's a fantastic film. It's a fantastic story. Fantastic acting. Yeah. Um, and including that would be, you know, how, how vivid all these characters were, especially especially his character. So. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, speaking of the vivid characters then, I mean, um, did you feel that any of the characters, even on even our, our, our Rebel buddies were underdeveloped any i mean were, were there maybe too many i think well, I, I think riz ahmed was kind of underserved by the story to be honest you know uh, that's how i felt when i was watching the film and then again yeah. after the film i felt wow he was also so good i mean he, he was yeah, good go with what he does i mean i think i think that um he has he has moments but i feel like a lot of his performance got left on the cutting room floor mm-hmm. yeah probably you know right uh, but I mean, I felt like I thoroughly understood this guy. Yeah, and he had this worn-out pilot look. Uh, there's a point where he had he mentions briefly this conversation he had with what's his name, Galen. Galen, yeah. Uh, About uh, getting right Galen with himself. Told, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and all those subtle moments uh, that uh, there I appreciated. So yeah, I mean, like for answer your question, at first I thought, well, there are so many characters. How am I going to keep uh, keep this keep uh, up with everything and I thought even for that they did a fantastic job. I mean, this mm-hmm. is a good, good movie, Star Wars or not. Well, and yeah. and it's funny because you know a lot of the commentary you see is you know the the second half is stronger than the first half, and and I mm-hmm. I don't think that's invalid, but I think the first half is all about paying off in the second. Half. I mean, yeah. we we need yeah. you got to plant yeah. the field so that you can you can uh-huh. you can harvest the crop later. You know, uh, totally, right, totally. right. Yeah, people yeah. forget that. I mean, I mean, uh, Titanic was like that. The whole second half of Titanic was the big action stuff. Jurassic Park was like that. I mean, it takes off about halfway into Star it. Star Wars is like that. I've heard of this movie. <laughs> the original Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. um, but b- beyond that, I mean, I think, um, obviously, we're, we're talking around the, the main character, Jin Erso. Mm-hmm. And I, th- I think this, this is kind of an interesting situation because I was uh, before we got on, I was I was reading up on how a lot of her performance was sort of shaped in post production and via the reshoots, and they sort of changed her from being much more abrasive, and not abrasive, but but uh, combative maybe. Mm-hmm. And we definitely mm-hmm. don't we we get the sense that she she can take care of herself in a fight, but mm-hmm. she's not. Mm-hmm. There was there was a line in one of the trailers where she's like, "You're a rebellion. I rebel." Yeah. Yeah, and, right, and instinctively, right. I was like, I hate that line. <laughs> See, that's funny. I enjoyed it just because it was so over the top. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah. I was like, I don't know about that. And then, and then when it didn't make it in the movie, I was like, all right, well, okay, that's a, you know. Uh, but uh, th- there, there was obviously some thought that went into that. And I mean, I, I think it, it's interesting in a broader perspective that we have now two Star Wars films in a row, and these are both out of Disney, where the main character is specifically a female. Yeah, total Disney princess films. I like the I like the Star Wars variation of the Disney princess film, right. <laughs> and, and it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Uh, remind me at some point in the conversation, uh, a friend of mine has like the greatest uh, theory about about Snoke and everything that you probably already read somewhere. But yeah, we'll get to that. Oh, I want to hear it. Okay, uh, we'll, yeah. we'll come back to that. Uh, but I mean, b- beyond just that, I mean, this entire the the 
crew of Rogue One, there's not a white male in it. I mean, it's it's specifically meant as a statement of diversity, and we've mm-hmm. we've seen the both the writers uh, have talked about how the the Empire is, uh, you know, it's meant to be a white supremacist organization, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. I, the timing for a film like this could not be more apropos. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know yeah. what I found interesting. I mean, speaking of the timing, and, and it also kind of goes back to my question about where I felt that the movie had me hooked was when we get to um, I guess it's it's planet Je- uh, is it Je- I guess Jeddah City Jedi. right yeah. where... the holy city of Jeddah yes yeah, <laughs> right. yeah. So it, it, it really is the holy place. city right yeah. it's yeah. got the temple and all that stuff but the, the British Wahhabis that I've taken anyway go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. but yeah I mean no to that point you know I mean you know I know you're being a little a little tongue in cheek Omar but like I, we we see we see occupation we see you know uh, resistance against occupation and we and and so that was the moment for me where i was like okay this is this is it this is the movie that is like to go back to my earliest point which is like this is the movie that's sort of grown up with me and mm-hmm. to your point zucky about being apropos and 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 whatnot i mean whether it was sort of the nationalism or white nationalism or what have you uh i, I felt that you know, the, the, like the references to resistance and occupation and terrorism were, I mean, right on the nose, right? I mean, mm-hmm. you couldn't help but, yeah, feel that there was a commentary being made. And uh, I, I thought that was just brilliant. I thought, it, mm-hmm. you know, and they didn't simplify things. They showed the complexity because, to tell you the truth, one of the other things that I thought that this movie, like you said, Omar, uh, uh, Zaki, at the, also kind of early on, was that not only did it take that it fill in the lines of those of that first opening crawl in episode four, but mm-hmm. it also kind of adds nuance and layer to it. And uh, for me, the nuance and layer was that even the rebels, like the good guys, aren't so so good, man. They're not, mm-hmm. they're, yeah. you know, they're not snowflakes. They, they, you know, we we see early on, um, um, what's his character, Ca- uh, uh, was it C- Cassian? Yeah, uh, sorry. Cassian. Uh, yeah, Diego, yeah. Cassian kill, you know, kill that yeah. guy. And yeah. and so yeah, I mean even the rebels are sort of conflicted and and are doing things that are you know, yeah. So I, I thought it was I I really enjoyed that part of it. I mean the mm-hmm. political comment. I don't know. Well, Omar, and, I think and I mean, you know, that that character specifically. His his arc is kind of interesting and I I I kind of I wanted them to pay it off a little bit more because obviously our first introduction to him like you said is him making this hard choice like uh, yeah. he he kills that guy because he won't be able to get away from the Imperials. Mm-hmm. And, you mm-hmm. know, so obviously he's making the calculation that, that this is better than whatever's right. going to happen in there. But so I mean, yeah. and he does it without thinking, you know, like mm-hmm. it's, it's instinctive. And, and at some point during the film, he, he starts, you know, making questioning, you know, he, he's ordered to assassinate Galen or so. And he, mm-hmm. he makes a choice not to do that. I I wanted to see that turn illuminated a little bit more because I felt mm-hmm. like it was almost too subtextual. Mm-hmm. See, uh, when he kills that guy at the beginning, I forgot what his name is, the guy with one arm or whatever right. it is. Uh, uh, I could have been uh, projecting onto it, but it seemed like he had this look of, of regret, shock, uh, something inside him went wrong after he killed him. And so when later on in the film, he's in the moment where he has to kill Galen. Yeah. Uh, I was expecting him not to kill him because of that scene that came earlier. Hmm. Uh, uh, but I mean, related to, relate to your point, uh, uh, Pervez, uh, about, about complexity. I mean, uh, I remember counting throughout the course of the film, there's like four rebel movements. So there's uh, Forrest Whitaker. Uh, right. I forgot yeah. what they were called. Sal the, the, the partisans. Oh, that's what they were called? Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Saw Guerrera and his partisans. Yeah, and yeah they, uh, you're right. I didn't even talk about that. The various factions within the rebel. The, the idea rebel that alliance. those guys are too extreme for the rebellion. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you have the overall rebellion with all the alliances. Then you have these guys, the rogues. And who is the fourth one that I was counting uh, in the film? Um, somebody else somewhere in there. That And Jin was part of all of this. Sure. Uh, or uh, her father. Her, her father, father, right. You know, within the empire. The undercover guy. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, again, back to how, how wonderfully complex this movie was. That was part of the reason why I had so much trouble making sense of it. I had to literally go through 
and try to uh, organize in my head what I just seen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a really wonderful, like almost uh, uh, sociological study of of occupation and resistance. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I and I just I, I I thought it was brilliantly done, and and uh, you know, uh, I mean, I agree with you guys in terms of the performances were spot on, all of them. I mean, uh, you know, they were just really great performances. Um, I guess I mean since we're talking about the various rebel, uh, like the, the like the various yeah. rebel groups and factions, uh, let's talk about the Sufis, man. Um, <laughs> oh, most overtly Muslim <laughs> uh Star Wars uh, part part of a Star Wars movie we've seen, right? I mean, this was interesting. Um, I'm, Which, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one sorry, with I'm the sorry, force. I'm the force is with me. Oh, okay, oh, okay, okay. So this was basically basically Wahdatul Wujud. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, they're guardians of the temple. They're not exactly. They're not Jedi's themselves, but they, mm-hmm. you know, they 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 have, I, I guess, fealty to the the Jedi, you know, way, and and they are, you know, um, yeah, murids of the Jedi, if you will, right? To that's borrow. funny because uh, as, as I was watching the that, lines, yeah, I saw them as like you know, uh, and people are going to misunderstand this, but the Salafis among the Sufis, like um, remember uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. Had Jade Fox, who basically was going through the manuals. She she wasn't part of the whole silsila of the teachers. The whole okay. and so she was she was doing the teaching herself. And in her case, she was she was bad, right? And so these were people who who were trying to connect. They couldn't connect to a silsila, and so they're trying to construct it themselves. So they'd be almost. Um, you know, reconstructionist Sufis. That's basically what's entertaining me as I watch that. <laughs> and thus, well, and, and, they were and blind. And the two of them, though... Out. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, finish Sorry. your point. No, I was just Sorry. saying. Then, and so thus, uh, Donnie Yen, he was blind, and right. yet he was not blind. Yes. Yeah, oh. and I thought also, uh, you know, you have a... Like, there's a subtlety between Donnie Yen's character and, is it Wen, Wen, Wen Jiang? Like, ba- like, the other character who has the big machine gun basically yeah uh like where he was like someone who once believed but no longer does because he mm-hmm. has a moment at the end right where yeah. where i guess faith is restored once he sees donnie and sacrifice um but um yeah i mean i just thought yeah it, th- that was very interesting i mean i think uh and the fact that they uh are sort of selling their wares in terms of like for, you know telling people's fortunes and whatnot i mean that's how we were first introduced to the character mm-hmm. Yeah, at you know, first that, he's, he's almost a, a hustler. A uh, hustler, right, yeah. right, in the marketplace. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, like, she she asked him like, "Why do you know? Why did you know I'm here?" Or something. He says, "Well, you're gonna have to pay, and I'll tell you." Right. Yeah. yeah. I now, I, think, I I, I think Sorry, uh, real quick. I mean, I I think out of all the characters, I I really liked uh, cheer it the most. Mm-hmm. I just I Donnie Yen made so many interesting choices just as a performer, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and and. I, I think I think all the deaths are effective, but I really I found his especially poignant. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know why. Yeah. I mean, you know, I yeah. I just uh, I just it was it it really worked. I th- I thought his his arc in in the film uh, it, it spoke to me. You know, the idea that that his that was his his journey was to be there at that pivotal moment, and once that was yeah. fulfilled, he could he could die peacefully. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I mean. Uh, so like, you know, uh, much of like the thematic aspect of this film is, is, you know, mythologically or in terms of the whole Star Wars canon, this is at the edges, right? And yeah. then he's at the edge of these people who are at the edge and, and he, in his whole life is trying to find the force, right? right? Even if he has to do these out loud of God just to make it happen. Hmm. And then he has this moment where he, he, uh, he gives it all up. To uh, to save the day. I mean, he's not trying to save the day to get the mission accomplished, and then that allows the force to find him. And yeah, I thought that was really, really beautiful. It was really nice. <laughs> Perfect. What were you saying? Uh, I, I don't remember. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, it, it was just yeah. Um, what else? Let's see. Um, well, we haven't talked about Darth Vader. <clears throat> we haven't uh, talked about Darth Vader, and I guess maybe a broader conversation around just the various, I guess the the, the like the real uh, sort of on the nose homages to uh, the whether it's the original trilogy or the prequels that we do see in the in, in the movie. <laughs> well, it's nice to see Jimmy Smith again as yeah. as uh, Bail Organa, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I say that as number one, I'm just a big Jimmy Smith fan. 
Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I thought his character was an interesting one in the prequels and, and I'm not somebody who hates the prequels. Uh, I think that there's aspects of them that are worth pulling from to, mm-hmm. uh, that add Especially texture. What's yeah. that? Especially the, uh, the closing credits. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, so it's, wait, you know, one thing, one thing I've said about the prequels is that mm-hmm. they're, they have better ideas than execution. And I think, uh, mm-hmm. I think the political aspect of it, of, of the prequel trilogy, is really bang on. I think that mm-hmm. Luke, and we see it, by the way, playing out right now, but I mean, he really went into his, the historical precedent for how mm-hmm. republics fall. And, mm-hmm. and I think when you go through and examine the emperor's plan, it mm-hmm. hangs together really, really well. Mm-hmm. You see exactly yeah. what he was doing. I think that in execution, uh, obviously the, the writing was was what it was, and I think I think the the fall of Darth Vader being tied into that, it just didn't it didn't work the way it, which the way it should have. But I can look at yeah. the, those films holistically, and say yeah. there's a lot there that's worth pulling from. Uh-huh. And yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. no, no, go ahead. So I mean, yeah, it's uh, those are like uh george lucas's outdoor films right it's exactly. him it's entirely him through and through yeah whereas this film perhaps even more than force awakens this is a collaboration sure and yeah. and thus i think it's only natural that this would be this would feel like a, a superior product both in terms of 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 how much is in there how much content is packed into this film and how well it's executed because even though it's gareth edwards movie i mean it feels like uh, a whole team project, whereas uh, the prequels from start to finish, uh, all we thought about was George Lucas. That's right. You know, That's so really like true. I mean, it, it's it, it, the democracy. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, the, the, obviously, there's the the Disney machine is now. So, you yeah. know, it's not going to let one person have the the voice straight yeah. through from beginning to end. And yet, I mean, it, in in many important ways, this film feels much more of a piece with those original, at least the original two, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. than than anything that's come after. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. I think that that aesthetically and even uh-huh. tonally, it's 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 of a piece with The Empire Strikes Back. Mm-hmm. The, uh, in terms of aesthetics, um, one thing that I kept wondering about as I watched the film, and it might have only just been art and design, was was the use of the color orange. Like, uh, like I kept noticing, you know, you had those walkers, the at yeah. that had a big orange wall. Um, they're, like, there's always some small amount of orange in almost every single frame, especially in the second half of the film. And I was trying to figure out through the course of the film, is this... Is this just something in terms of just the beauty of the film, or is this something like Godfather, where every time an orange, uh, mm. an actual physical orange appeared on the film, someone's going to die? Oh, how interesting. I couldn't figure that out. But now that you mentioned Empire Strikes Back, I'm remembering Orange in the in the lightsaber duel between yeah. uh, Luke and Darth um, at the end, where it's, everything's like blue and orange. That's and right. of course, yeah, blue and orange are usually those two big colors that everybody uses to show the two spectrums of, of light, but I didn't see as much blue, but orange was always present, and... Uh, uh, I, I couldn't put my finger on it. it, almost to the point where I almost want to watch the movie again just to see how Orange plays out in this film. Oh, how interesting! Yeah, I, I... that is a, that is. I, I didn't even think about that, but that's so. They, yeah, that that is a really interesting observation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, I mean, one of my favorite scenes in in, in uh, Empire uh, is the um, carbon freezing scene, and that's mm-hmm. very orange. That's yeah, all orange, exactly. Yeah, the very the, the palette is very orange. In fact, Cloud City most of the most of the uh, uh, scenes in Con Cloud City Bespin <laughs> are orange. Yeah. Um, Zucky, were you going to say something? I, I wanted to jump back real quick to yeah, the homages it. or the care. Yeah. yeah. So I guess before I, I mean certainly Bill. Yeah, it, it was like you said, Zucky. It was good to see Bill Organa and and maybe see a little bit more about that character. Um, mm-hmm. Same with. Mon Mothma, right? I mean, uh-huh. in terms of a uh, character that, well, she was cut. She she was left on the uh, cutting room floor in terms of the prequels, but the same actress was playing that role, um, I guess, in episode three. That's right. Um, but uh, what, do you, three, what did yeah. you guys think of Tarkin, man? What did you guys think of Moff Tarkin? Let's talk about the full CGI I Tarkin uh, of P- uh, Peter Cushing. I kept getting distracted, actually. Really? Uh, really? Oh. And it may be because I already knew he was dead. Like, I didn't know <laughs> until, like, you know, moments before the film, someone, some article, someplace mentioned he's in the film. 
and oh. and it said something about CGI. And so maybe I was I was already clued in to look for it, but I kept getting distracted. Not enough that you know I had a Jar Jar moment or anything, but right. um, because he still he was still you know that slimy evil character um that uh may have saved it for me but that and then princess leia like i knew princess leia was gonna appear at the end i was like okay no this there's if they had tarkin that much yeah he's gonna appear and and that didn't distract me as much perhaps because i was expecting it i mean what do you think did you did uh how to work out for you so it's interesting i thought when, when, when we first are introduced to to him I, I was like wait no way they're gonna i thought they were just gonna just show us the reflection because when we're first <laughs> When we first see him on, on scene, on, 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 I guess on in, in the scene, yeah. he's got his back turned. There's a reflection yeah, in the right. mirror, and so I thought, you know, maybe that's at, uh, in the window. That, that, that's all that they're going to do. But then yeah. when they when he turns around and it's full, like they're just yeah, they're going to show this character. Yeah. I thought, okay, wow, interesting. Now I, I will say this: like the people, again, some of the people who I saw it with who hadn't, who, like for example, didn't didn't know Peter Cushing died or yeah. whatever. They actually thought they didn't even. I mean, a couple yeah, of people didn't even know it's full CGI. Yeah, I, that would make sense. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're not looking for it, you wouldn't. Know. I mean, my my kids are the same way, right? Like it, it yeah. wouldn't even. All they know is, oh, that's the character from Star Wars. Mm. Now let me ask you. Now it, there is an actor credited in the scene. So is it motion capture? So uh, so go yeah. Ahead. Go ahead, Omar. No, I was just going to say. I mean, I mean, Zaki, you probably know exactly what happened. I was just assuming they had a stand-in. Yeah. And then just put uh, Cushing's face on it. That's what I was assuming. Yeah. yeah. And then someone else's voice. Like they basically did a Darth Vader. It's it's a digital mask, basically. Uh-huh. Yeah. That, that, that they put and, in it. And also, they used the same Darth Vader style mask that they had in Episode Four, didn't they? With like the reddish eyes. With the red lenses, reddish yeah. eyes. Yeah. I yeah. saw that exactly yeah. because I mean, and that makes again aesthetically that makes sense. Um, yeah. uh, so okay, I guess let's talk about Darth Vader. Um, you know. Wait, so Zucky, you were going to say about about Tarkin, I guess. Why don't, yeah, why, why don't you? Well, we, just, we, just, we I mean, I, I, I've just gauging from reaction online, it, it, the presence of that character in the film is appears to be very polarizing. I personally loved it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I found it only distracting to the extent that I know, like like Omar said, I know he's yeah. dead, so I'm looking for the seams. Yeah, that's probably what I was doing. You know, yeah. and and I I think that well, it it is artificial. So you are go- there's going to be an aspect of uncanny valley to it. But I yeah. think when you take a step back and look at what they've uh-huh. accomplished, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, and I'm waiting to see how things play out in the future movies, not just yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, like I, Mar- I've, like- I've said I've said elsewhere that I think I'm I'm absolutely certain that the ne- episode eight. We'll have a youthified Han Solo, Luke Skywalker, and Princess Leia that in yeah. a flashback that fills in what happened mm-hmm. between trilogies. I think I think what yeah. we saw in Rogue One is a dress rehearsal for what we're going to yeah. see next year. Uh, but see, youthifying. Now that's interesting. You say that. Uh, um, I think youthifying an existing actor yeah, like yeah. who's yeah. alive, and they can bring in a la Michael Douglas in uh, Ant Man, right? Which uh, I thought was seamless. I literally thought I was looking at Michael Douglas circa like, like Black Rain or something, yeah. right? Wall yeah. Street, exactly. Um, so. So uh, to me, that's I think that it, it, they can they, they, we, we we've seen it done and we've seen it yeah. done immaculately. Oh, even Robert Downey Jr. Jr. in uh, Civil, oh, War. Civil War. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, look like a teenager. So um, I think that that's more. I think that's easier. That, that's easier to pull off, at least tech, yeah. given the technology. It's where you bring back, like, say, so in this case, someone like Peter Cushing. Um, yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I mean, in, I, in in so far, I mean, uh, my perspective is well, his his family okayed it. And, oh, interesting. So they actually oh, got permission. Yeah, okay. I mean, they they needed to get permission, and they did. Uh-huh. And you know, th- I'm like, well, if the family is okay with it, then that's fine with me. I mean, you know, oh, like, I didn't mean that. I, I meant I meant in terms of just how it looks and and how yeah. it comes across. I mean, uh-huh. the, like the legalities aside, but I yeah. mean, I, I, yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, somebody sure. somebody like Peter Cushing, there's there's they they had such a volume of of material to draw from. Uh-huh. That that's how they were yeah, able to all those films, yeah, yeah. I mean, and you know, now that I'm thinking about it, you know what else they had, uh, uh, like a really young version of R two D two and C three PO. They they CG unified them too. <laughs> yeah. 
for, for like the, the for like star. the ten seconds that they're in this. It, not even ten seconds. Yeah, they got permission for the Death Star to have like that young version. I don't. They had to talk to the family. They had to get permission. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if the Death Star has any heirs because <laughs> because the Death Star two and Sky Star Killer Base both uh, uh, no longer exist. So I don't know that there's no true, true. there's no lineage anymore. <laughs> but I mean, this, this will be interesting to see where this, all this goes in terms of movies. Yeah, uh, is what it basically opened the door for, and then you know add George Lucas to this, who always does stuff like this. I mean, we're we're going to see like Elvis, you know, probably in episode ten, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and it'll probably look real, you know. But I mean, but in all seriousness, we might have future movies where it'll be a mix of current and old actors. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and and I mean. I mean the the technology it's it's happening whether yeah. you like it or not. So I mean, just right. when you look at how how quickly this technology has evolved. I mean, look at uh, five six years ago that the Tron movie with with Jeff. Yeah, Bruce. right, right. And and yeah. that that looked noticeably fake. And you compare that to the stuff they're doing now. I mean, it's it's evolving very very fast. So I think that the <laughs> uncanny valley issues will. Yeah. I, I think they're going to go away at some point. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I mean, it also raises like these ethical questions, right? I mean, before maybe twenty years ago, we were all talking about airbrushing. Like, is this okay? Because you're you're totally changing the person, right? And now we're talking about completely recreating a person, and uh, you know, who knows where it's going to go from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah fascinating, That's a um, scary place to. I, I guess since we're talking about since we're talking about the the, the sort of CGI characters and and just yeah. the special effects. I mean, I think we can all agree. Uh, this this movie certainly had more CGI than we saw in Force Awakens, mm. uh, but 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 verdict like did you did you guys like it? I mean I, I thought I thought it was fabulous, I thought it was seamless. Yeah, I thought it was fabulous. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no question. Yeah, I mean the, like the uh, the environments we see, Zucky. I mean I feel like we were almost planet hopping, like with the like you mentioned uh, the little name cards um, as we were going from planet to planet and system to system. I mean I thought that that was really interesting, but that's a new thing uh, for the these movies. It is a new thing for uh, these no movies. wipes between scenes and uh, having mm-hmm. planet labels. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Oh, and speaking of new things for this movie, what did you find the lack of an opening crawl uh, discomforting or jarring? I'm I'm glad um, it didn't have a crawl. I didn't want it to have a crawl. Uh, I mean, I was neither. I was ambivalent. I mean, <laughs> my was my thing was I I was like. What I said a while ago was I think the one consistent thing should be the a long time ago card. It should look exactly the same. But beyond that, I I think the saga movies should be the ones with the Star Wars label and the 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 crawl. Uh the canon. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, these are all canon now. And and speaking of canon, what I also thought found interesting was, you know, and and same with the Force Awakens, but even now more so with uh with 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 Rogue One, they, they they're drawing a lot from whether it's the expanded universe or the animated series, you know, mm-hmm. series, uh, because like the whole mention of not just mention, but the the, the, the Kybar crystals playing such a mm-hmm. such an important role. I mean, that's that's that that that's all. That's well, all. I, I love the fact. I love the yeah. fact that the Kybar crystals are the source of the. That's what lightsabers Lights. are made from, and yeah. the Empire says, "No, we're going to mm-hmm. turn this into. We're going to use them for this." Uh, the most destructive purpose possible. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a neat poetry right there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the sure. yeah. There, you know? uh, yeah. I mean, I keep hearing, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no, no, I was just going to say like to, 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 to go back to Zucky, what you were saying earlier, again, to add layer and nuance to the, uh, to, to the, to the movies, we, to the, to the original trilogy we love. Uh, what I also found interesting was, I mean, the idea of, I remember like even with the a new hope and star Wars, the first movie, you know, or not, whatever, right? You know what I mean. First in chronological order, um, the you know, like the apparent flaw in the Death Star, and I remember it became like this running joke among fans, right? I mean, that that such a such a massive uh, and, and, and destructible like uh, or, or machine that could cause such destruction mm-hmm. at such an inherent flaw. Well, I, I love the the sort of explanation we get for that in this movie, which was that it was by design, right? I mean that. Uh, Mendelssohn's character puts that in there as a flaw. M- Mickelson, Matt oh. Mickelson. Mickelson. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is actually something I want to ask you guys about. Go, yeah, please. Let's because, talk about that. So yeah, uh, I was thinking the same thing. That oh, cool. They've finally given an explanation for this. But then I thought, all right, if uh, 
uh, why didn't Galen, if he had the capability of getting, you know, Riz Ahmed or whatever his name was, uh, Bobby, Bodhi, Bodhi, Dobby, okay, uh, getting Bodhi to send the message, why didn't he just send the plans? Well, because he he wouldn't have been able to get him out without arousing suspicion. Okay, okay, that's fine. That works for me. I just still thought, all right. Because I mean, we saw the, 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 uh, the plans. He, he sent Bodhi from yeah. his from Edu. But the okay. plans were on uh, Scarif. But yeah, Scarif. the plans would be there. But wouldn't uh, Galen know? I mean, and then I guess Galen still did explain that you know here is here's uh, like he says okay there's this weakness and he kind of explains what the weakness is. He's, but, he sa- he okay. says in the message he says in the me- which by the way I love I love Felicity Jones acting during the scene when you just see her start oh, to break man. down while she's watching the the video of her father. It's fantastic. But, and they're, they're like looking straight at each other. I oh, thought that was cool. great. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, it was so well done. And, and, yeah. and, but he says, you need to analyze the plan. Like, he's like, he's uh, like okay. it's hidden he in the plans. That. It's in the reactor. Yeah. You need to analyze the plans to find it. Yeah. But it's in the okay. reactor. Still seems to me that he could have just, if he's the guy who invented it all, he could have just said, hey, oh, by the way, yeah, at right. the end of the telegram message are the plans. Anyway, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And no, then there's no have, movie, you know, right? Rogue point zero zero one explaining why <laughs> you have to send that message. The prequel to the prequel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I think the character of Galen Erso is itself. So, I just I found him a really, uh, you know, the the idea of of heroism comes in different forms. I mean, yeah. the idea that he essentially he's like this is the only way. like if I kill myself, they'll just finish it. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're gonna make it anyway. Yeah, they're gonna. Yeah. So, but this is I. If I make myself indispensable, yeah. I can stop it. Yeah, this and, uh, at the risk of bringing up um, a controversial issue. You know, back in the day when I used to support uh, MLI, sure. and the 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 Star Wars person in me thought that you know what they can do, they can become these like reverse hypocrites where they're pretending to be apologists and they're secretly placing a big hole <laughs> that other people can come in. And then now it was redeemed in Rogue One. That was back in the day when I used to support it. But yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So as as we kind of wrap things up, wow, that's like a yeah. that's like a heavy place to to leave things. But kind of kind of <laughs> uh, sort of a final thoughts about the film as yeah. as we as we sum up this discussion. Uh, well, I mean, we I I, I mean, I didn't get your I, I guess didn't really talk about Darth Vader as much, but I mean, <laughs> you know. We, we we see him. We I I, almost, I felt like that last scene. Oh, that was like, awesome. I, I thought, I thought before before that last scene, I thought we had seen all that we were going to see of, of Vader after mm-hmm. that sort of maybe extensive scene that he has the most dialogue with uh, James mm-hmm. Earl Jones' voice. Um, I thought we were going to see him again, and so that little added bonus scene, I guess, at the end where he goes crazy. Um, yeah. I thought, which was one, I the the, the, the little geek in me, I, I guess, uh, loved it, and the ten year old in me, you know, still there was still enough of 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 it of that of that kind of stuff in in the movie where it it, it still did you know conjure up you know those feelings for like the ten year old in me, but yeah, uh, yeah, I thought it was I thought it was really well done. Yeah, it uh, it uh, recall that scene of Revenge of the Sith where he wipes out all the younglings. You know, before he actually Darth Vader fights himself, or sure. before he gets chopped up, and uh, yeah, it was it was like appropriately like it was a nasty. brutality to this one. Yeah, yeah where yeah. I that, feel see, that, yeah. that was always my problem with Revenge of the Sith was that scene in particular yeah. because because I if you want to you, make you your want character to evil, what's that? Yeah. You want to see the kids get killed? Huh? Well, I'm kind of oh, I'm kind of like you, you you don't get to redeem the character after doing that. Yeah, right, right. That's yeah. that's my like. I, I'm like, if you, there's like ten other ways to show how evil your character is without having yeah. him massacre children, mm-hmm. especially yeah, totally. because because when Lucas made the movie, I mean, it, he knew where it was ending, and I'm like, no, no, mm-hmm. it's uh, like, I mean, Omar, you know this, Pervez, you know this. Like, I'm not gonna have sympathy for somebody who does something like that. Yeah, are you saying like all the way when we get to Return of the Jedi, you're like, no, nope, too late. I I yeah. feel. I mean, I do feel that way because I'm like. Yeah. I, I think that there's some things you don't get to come back from. Uh-huh. You yeah. know, you just reminded me of this is again, probably totally turning this in directions you guys weren't expecting. You know, you know, those, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the authenticity is. Uh, there's the, the, the narrations about Omar may be pleased with him mm-hmm. that he used to laugh and he used to cry. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, okay. So like, I'll tell you both stories. I'll try to be really, really quick. Um, he used to laugh. This is in his Khali- uh, Khalifa days. Okay. And so right. they asked, why are you laughing? And he said, when I, in my Jahiliya days, 
uh, I had this idol and I was going on a trip and I realized I forgot my idol. And so I brought, I had these dates with me. So I made my idol out of these dates and then I got hungry. And so I had to eat my idol. And so he used to laugh about that. Hmm. That's the happy ah. part. But then there's the sad part, which is what you just reminded me of, uh, Zucky, hmm. that he used to cry. They asked him, why are you crying? He said, uh, I'm remembering from my Jahiliya days that I had a daughter. And yeah. Yeah, you see where this is going. And so, and I loved her so much that I didn't want to bury her, which uh, for those who aren't familiar with, this was the, the tradition in Buckeye at the time. And so I kept her with me for some time, but then my, my loyalty to the tradition overtook me and I had to bury her. And so as I'm putting the dirt over her face, the dirt is also getting in my beard and she's reaching up to, to, to knock the dirt off my beard as I'm burying her to her death. Wow. So. So subhanAllah. Anyway, that's probably not the most appropriate reference at this moment, but that's what you reminded me wow. with all the state brain. We just got heavier. We just got heavier. Uh, <laughs> we can't end on infanticide. So let's yeah. just a little. So let's just make uh, but, yeah. Well, yeah, I, okay. No, so that, that, so that, that, maybe just, just uh, uh, pivoting a little bit. Uh, after, after this ended, and everyone here seems to agree that, that it's a very solid start to yeah. the spinoff movies, uh, what, mm -hmm. what spinoffs would you uh, like to see next? I know, I know personally for me, uh, it made me really excited for the, the Han Solo movie. Mm -hmm. uh, cause I, With the Han Solo movie, I definitely want to see more on Lando. I don't want him to be like this guy who's selling Colt 45, malt liquor. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, I always felt like I got gypped by Darth Maul dying like in five minutes. Sure. Uh, I mean, that would be cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, per per, per the the canon, he, he is mm -hmm. still alive. So the, he is. The, well, I didn't yeah, know that. Uh, they brought him back on the Clone Wars. Uh, on TV the cartoons? Series. Oh, okay. Okay. So, oh, I uh, didn't know that. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So, and he has like a cybernetic uh, lower appendages. Huh. Uh, so he's the character is available. You know, I, I think... Uh, I don't see any reason why they can't uh, bring him back in some capacity in the films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I saw enough. I mean, I, for me, like, I, I, like Gareth Edwards' treatment of the prequels is as far as into the prequels as I want to get. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm still way too jaded over those movies. So, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, you know, it was like when I left Force Awakens, I was like, oh, phew. Like, one, one of the things I did like yeah. about Force Awakens was no reference at all. You didn't have to know anything about the prequels to love mm -hmm. the to enjoy the movie. This one, there was enough, like, sort of touching on some of the things that were introduced and maybe even some locations and so on, characters, but that was it. And <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, to your question, Zucky, I don't know. Um, I uh, I guess, you know, uh, there, yeah, the, I was beyond the Han Solo movie. I, I really don't know what else there might be out there, uh, but uh, there's certainly a, um, a rich... Uh, you know, a, a lot of rich material there to to draw from now. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we're we're just looking for good movies. Yeah, uh, that's what it all comes down to. I mean, in my brain, I was also thinking. I mean, this is again to show you why where my mind goes. So, Job of the Hut was not in this film, right? Yeah. And everybody's been talking about the low carb keto diet lately, and I was thinking, well, he probably doesn't eat any bread, so why is he still so fat? You know, <laughs> that could be something that could probably explore to at some point. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that's how he looks after the keto diet. You know, cause, I mean, that's, all he did was eat animals, like that frog thing or whatever. You know, you know that would be that'd be cool. You know, <laughs> or some relationship between Jabba the Hutt and the Death Star. You know, in some other life. Yeah. Oh man, good stuff. Yeah. Um, wait, wait. So wait, I, I, you were gonna say some great theory about Snoke, and I. And oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, but I, but before you bring that up, I want to say, does this in any way? As much as you guys enjoyed, as, as uh, all three of us enjoyed Rogue One, yeah. what does this say about how we how now feel, not only in hindsight about uh, Force Awakens, but expectations on Episode 8 and 9? Um, well, I mean, uh, to bring this back to the prequels, I almost feel like the greatest thing that happened to this whole saga is Phantom Menace. That it was so disappointing and so thoroughly attacked. Hmm. Huh. That it required them to raise the standard on everything. And so I'm very, very hopeful that whatever the story is, it's going to be really fantastic. But I realized watching watching Rogue One that um, we will, I'll truly be able to appreciate Force Awakens based on how good the other two movies are. Like, what is it actually setting up? We have all of our theories, 
And when we see what it really sets up, if that satisfies us, then Force Awakens is going to be a fantastic film, you know, as part of the whole the whole series. And so, so the theory, this goes to Dr. Mahan Mirza. Have you guys ever had him on your show? He's like, he'd be really good. No, no we'd but, like oh, to though. Oh, you totally yeah, did. And, so, and yeah. he was here, obviously, at Zaytuna, and now yeah, went yeah. back. Yeah, yeah. So, so Dr. Mahan and I, we are, you know, kindred nerds. And and so his theory, which he he got from the first. By the way, Mahan, Mahan does listen to the show. So. Oh, okay. Um, hey, yeah. Mahan, how you doing? Mahan, how you doing? Oh. Anyway, in that case, so like um, so so Dr. Mahan's theory is Snoke is ready, ready. Let's hear it. It's Princess Leia. And and so he has a whole complex theory that you have to bring him uh, onto the show for, but take it all the way back to the, the ongoing yin-yang thing that takes place in this whole series, right? You got the Jedi and the Sith, and so Luke is the good, and Princess Leia, General Leia, whatever she becomes later on, she's actually uh, the Dark Force. She's the one who sends Kylo, uh, Han Solo to get killed by Kylo Ren. And this is why Luke has gone away um in hiding and trying to figure out like you know what to do from all here so she's actually the force of evil wow so just it uh, when he first said it, i thought that's yeah that's pretty interesting that's very mahanish but uh as i thought about <laughs> it more, and more it was mahanish it was very very profound let yourself uh ruminate over it huh and interesting well that's something to think about come, yeah at least if you can come up with something that would be more like uh pre- preposterously amazing because I uh, I can't come up with anything that would be like more worse and better in the sense that this would yeah. knock everybody's socks off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That the, very true. The, very true. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I will I will have to sort of ruminate on that. Uh, but uh, and, and thank you for 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 sharing that. Um, but but yeah. To, to, any thoughts on on my question, Zaki, about about expectations? Um, I mean, I, I what I wanted to quickly say about that was I, I feel as though. One of the things that Rogue One did tell me, um, prequels or sequels or whatever may be the case, is that the what 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 bringing in new blood um, into the franchise uh, or into the universe can do to these films, because I mean, truth be told, as much as I mean, I, I like J.J. Abrams for what he does, uh, but he's a very functional sort of director, and he's he, he was great at sort of you know capturing the essence of the. Mm. Of the of the original trilogy that we loved. Yeah, he's a just, master at homage. Yeah. He's a master at homage. I mean that that yeah. that that is Abram's suit. Um yeah. whereas I think with Gareth Edwards bringing in that new blood and if, so the, which which has me hopeful for uh Ryan Johnson and what he's going to do with uh with with episode 8. Mhm. And I loved Looper. So if that means anything. Oh, I, mean, I loved Looper awesome. more than I loved Edwards' uh Godzilla. Mhm. Looper was fantastic. Oh, that's true. Yeah. That'd be a whole great conversation for like free will predestination on a different. Oh yeah, that would be great. That'd be yeah. great. Zucky, any thoughts on on, on that? Well, I think uh, you know what I what I've said about the Force Awakens from the start was I enjoyed it, but I can't form an opinion on it fully until I know where the story is going. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and you know that's fine. Uh, big, I mean, ultimately, it's it's. Uh, I think it's job it had a different job than than rogue one which was to set up everything not just the sequels coming but the the notion of star wars continuing and so it accomplished that task but in truth after episode nine we can look at the trilogy holistically and say Mm -hmm. well it succeeded here it didn't succeed there um Uh, so, so a a one-to-one comparison is not necessarily apt however Mm -hmm. i will say that um i Watching Rogue One by virtue of the fact that it's a complete story and you know exactly what it's leading into allows yeah. you to have mm-hmm. a more fully fleshed out emotional response, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. a more yeah. honest response in a way. Yeah. And yeah. and so I would say that when when Rogue One ended, it I felt more fulfilled than I did with The Force Awakens. Yeah, that's totally true. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Um, how's the, uh, and, and maybe this is the last point we can end on, Zucky, is, is, how, how's the movie doing? I mean, do we have numbers yet from the box yeah, office? Yeah, so or? it, well, I mean, it's, it's doing fine. Like, Star Wars is, is in no danger. Let's put it that no, way. No, I know. But, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it opened to it says, 155. Uh, box office mojo says, uh, $155 million so far. That's right, yeah. So that's three days. So that's, and, and to put this in perspective, I think that's, that's, this is, this is how, 
this franchise. That's about a hundred million less than what The Force Awakens opened to. But this is still one of the biggest opening weekends of all time. So, okay. you know, no, nobody should have gone into this expecting it to play like The Force Awakens. Because that was a 30 years later sequel to the the beloved original trilogy. Whereas this is, uh, you know, another Star Wars movie. Hmm. hmm. You know? True, true. But, I mean, yeah, certainly a win. Uh, or certainly, a, a, yeah, a notch in the win category. Yeah. yeah the, in terms of... I think that was that was a given, but I guess I, I know that you've had conversations, Zucky, on the other podcast, like in terms of like, I mean, it, you know, if this doesn't do Star Wars Force Awakens big, is it going to be somehow considered a lesser movie or a failure of any kind? No, I, I you know, I mean, again, it, it's it's open to, uh, a, a, you know, almost 250 million worldwide. Yeah. So they'll be doing fine. This is this is a very good strong start to uh what will be a long run of uh Star Wars spin-off movies. Yeah, Star Wars stories. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um Well, great. I think that's a good place to leave off uh, until until I guess until episode 8. So um uh, what yeah, is that, so, July? Well, well our, our guest, Umar, had to jump off, but uh, you can find him online. He he writes movie reviews for uh, RogerEbert.com, and I highly recommend checking out whatever he has to say because uh, I'm always interested in his thoughts on a movie. And uh, yeah. uh, Pervez, you want to tell people where they can get a hold of us? That's right. So if, uh, comments, feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. Um, or you can go to our Facebook page, engage us there, um, facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. If you like the show, please do share it with others and uh, give us a star rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find fine podcasts such as Diffuse Congruence. Well, with that, on behalf of my co host, Pervez Ahmed, and our guest, Irma Mazafar, this has been Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan, and we will catch you next time. Mm-hmm. <laughs>